Welcome to the Deep Dive. Hey there. Today we're really getting into the Behringer 2XM. It's billed as a classic polyphonic analog synth. Yep, and we've got uh, quite a mix of stuff to look at. We do. There's the product page from Behringer, you know, the marketing side. Right, the glossy stuff. Then there's the uh, end user license agreement, a bit more serious. Definitely drier, yeah, uh. the legal bits. And finally, the quick start guide, which is more hands-on getting started. So our mission basically is to pull all this together. Exactly. See what these different viewpoints tell us about the 2XM from like the sound capabilities right through to the terms of use. It's interesting, isn't it, how you get these different angles, the marketing hype, the legal boundaries, and then just how to make noise with it. Yeah, you need all three for the full picture, I think. Agreed. It gives you that uh, more rounded understanding. So let's start at the top. What's the basic pitch? What is the Behringer 2XM according to these documents? Well, the product page calls it a classic polyphonic analog synthesizer. That's the headline. Okay. Classic polyphonic analog keywords. Very much so. And the quick start guide starts breaking that down. It mentions four VCOs. Voltage controlled oscillators. The raw sound makers. Precisely. And then two multi-mode VCFs. Filters. Voltage controlled filters for shaping the tone. Yep. Plus you get two LFOs, low frequency oscillators for movement, modulation wobbles and sweeps kind of yeah and four envelopes which control how sounds you know start change and fade over time okay so four oscillators two filters lfos envelopes that sounds pretty well equipped for an analog synth especially polyphonic it does suggest a lot of sound shaping power and it's designed for your rack right yes the quick start guide says it's 80 hpy which means it's ready to slot into a modular setup though the product page pictures also show it in its own desktop case don't they they do so it offers some flexibility there use it standalone or integrate it right now something interesting in the quick start guide was this dual voice architecture xm1 and xm2 ah uh, yes that's a really important feature what does that actually mean for you the user it means it essentially has two independent synth sections inside xm1 and xm2 okay and the guide explains you can use them in different ways unison is one so both voices all four oscillators playing the same note for a massive sound exactly super thick or you can split them across a keyboard like bass sound on the left lead sound on the right precisely that or you can run them in a duo configuration meaning two completely separate melodic lines, maybe sequenced independently. It's almost like having two synths in one, really. Wow, okay. That's uh, quite a bit of flexibility built right in. It really is. And getting the sound out, what are the connections like? Audio outputs? On the back panel, you've got a couple of options. There's a 3.5 millimeter TRS stereo jack. Standard headphone style jack, but stereo. Right, and also two separate, bigger quarter inch TS jacks, 6.35 mil. So you can connect to mixers, interfaces, pedals, pretty standard stuff. Yeah, covers most bases. And for MIDI? For control, yeah. It's got the classic five pin DIN MIDI input and a MIDI through port as well. Useful for chaining gear. Definitely, plus there's a USB port, type B. For MIDI over USB connecting to a computer. Exactly, and the quick start guide notes, it's class compliant. Meaning yeah. no drivers needed usually. Usually, yeah. It's just plug and play with most modern Windows or Mac systems for MIDI. That's convenient. Now, I saw mention of a patch bay. That always sounds intriguing on a synth like this. Oh, yeah. The patch bay is where things get really interesting for sound design. It looked quite extensive. 32 jacks. 32 3.5 millimeter TRS jacks, yeah. It's not just inputs and outputs. What does it let you do then? It lets you override the internal signal routing. You can connect outputs of one section to inputs of another in ways the front panel knobs don't allow. Ah, uh, okay. So like taking an LFO from voice one and using it to modulate the filter on voice two? Exactly that kind of thing. Yeah. Or using an envelope to control pitch bend or patching external signals in, it really opens up experimental possibilities. Sounds like a proper playground for synthesis nerds. It definitely invites exploration. Yeah, okay, cool. And powering this playground, what does it need? The guide says, 12 volts DC, 2,000 milliamps, so two amps. That's quite a bit of current. It is, and if you're putting it into a Eurorack case, you need to make sure your case's power supply can deliver that two amps on the plus 12 volt rail. Along with the standard plus and minus 12 volts and ground for Eurorack. Correct. They do include a little adapter cable though, 10 pin to 16 pin, to help connect it to a standard Eurorack power bus. Handy. 
Okay, let's move to the front panel itself. The quick start guide lays out all the controls. It uh, looks like a lot of knobs and switches. It does look busy at first glance. But remember that dual voice thing. Ah, uh, right. A lot of it is duplicated for XM1 and XM2. Exactly. It's largely mirrored, which actually makes it quite logical once you grasp that. So what are the main sections for each voice? Okay, so for each XM, you've got your VCO1 and VCO2 sections, voltage-controlled oscillators again. You've got knobs for frequency, course, and fine-tuning, essential for getting pitches right. And creating intervals between the two oscillators in one voice. Yep. And importantly, modulation source switches for both the oscillators and the filters. So you choose what makes them change over time. Yeah. You can select things like one of the envelopes or the LFO mm. or maybe MIDI velocity. So how hard you hit a key could affect, say, the filter brightness. Exactly. Or the pitch. It adds expressiveness. Nice. Okay, so oscillators make the sound. Then the filters shape it. What controls do we have there? So each voice gets its own VCS, voltage-controlled filter, Again, multi-mode. Multi-mode meaning different types of filter. Right. You've got the main frequency knob, sets the cutoff point. Where the filtering happens. Yeah. Then resonance, which adds that peak or emphasis right at the cutoff. Can make it sound more buzzy or ringy. Squishy sounds. Can be, yeah. Yeah. And a modulation control for how much the chosen source affects that filter frequency. Right. And the filter types. You mentioned multi-mode. Yes. There's a response switch. This lets you choose between low-pass... Cutting the highs. Yeah, high pass. Cutting the lows. Dutch. Cutting a specific narrow band. Or band pass. Letting only a specific band through. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Each one gives a totally different character. Low pass is common for warm pads. High pass can thin things out. Band pass is great for more focused, almost vocal-like sounds sometimes. So quite a sonic toolkit just in the filter section. Absolutely. Very versatile. I also saw controls for pulse width on the VCOs. What effect does that have? Oh. Pulse width modulation, or PWM. Okay. That affects the shape of the pulse wave from the oscillators. Okay. A standard pulse wave is like a square wave, 50% up, 50% down, rich sound. Right. Changing the pulse width makes it asymmetrical. Narrower pulses sound thinner, reedier, change the harmonic content. So it's another way to change the basic tone of the oscillator. Yes, a classic synthesis technique. And you can often modulate it, maybe with an LFO, for that classic PWM sweeping sound. Cool. And there was a sync switch too, VCO sync. Yeah, that locks the phase of VCO2 to VCO1 within each voice. Right. When you then change the pitch of VCO2, you don't just get two notes. You get these really complex, sometimes aggressive harmonic changes. Great for cutting lead sounds. Sounds like fun to play with. Okay, one control that looked a bit different was labeled EXT. What's that for? EXT stands for external, or, well, it does double duty. How so? You can feed an external audio signal into the 2XM via the patch bay. Right. Turning the EXT knob counterclockwise blends that external signal in before the filter and VCA. You can process external sounds. Ah, oh, run a drum machine through its filter, maybe? Exactly. Turning the knob clockwise blends in the internal white noise generator instead. Good for percussion sounds, wind effects. Yeah, adding texture. But here's the clever bit. Okay. If you don't have anything plugged into the external input jack, okay. yeah. the synth internally routes a reference tone, an A440, like a tuning fork to that input. Oh, that's smart. So the EXT knob can become a tuning reference level. Precisely. It's a really thoughtful touch for keeping things in tune, especially if you're working with other analog gear. Very neat. Okay, moving across, there's a master section. Controls the overall output, I assume. Yep, you've got a master volume knob, simple enough. Right. But you also have individual level and pan controls for XM1 and XM2. Ah, so you can balance the two voices and position them in the stereo field if you're using that stereo output jack. Exactly. Create a nice stereo image. Mm. And the assigned mode switches here, too. We mentioned that unison split duo. That's one. And finally, portamento controls. One for each XM voice. Glide between notes. Classic sympathet. Yep, for those smooth slides and bends. And on the back panel, you mentioned MIDI, but were there other control connections? CB gate? Yes. Good point. The rear panel also has CV and gate outputs. Control voltage and gate signals. Right. These are derived from the incoming MIDI notes. Mm -hmm. So the 2XM can actually act as a MIDI to CV gate converter. Oh, useful. So you could use it to play other vintage analog synths or modular stuff that doesn't have MIDI. Exactly. Sequence something else from your MIDI controller via the 2XM. That has another layer of utility. Yeah. And MIDI channel selection. A little DIP switches on the back panel for setting the MIDI input channel. Old school, but effective. Okay, I think that covers the sound making and control side pretty well. But like any gear, there's the practical stuff. Safety, usage, 
The quick start guide covers that too? Oh, absolutely. Standard but important warnings. Like? The usual about risk of electric shock. Don't open it up yourself. Use qualified people for repairs. Basic electrical safety. Yep. And keeping it away from water or moisture. Cleaning only with a dry cloth. Don't block the vents. Right. Needs air circulation. Mm -hmm. Protect the power cord. Don't put it near heaters. All the common sense stuff for electronics. Good reminders, though. Anything specific stand out? Well, they give a recommended operating temperature range, 5 to 45 degrees Celsius. So about 41 to 113 Fahrenheit. Don't leave it cooking in the sun or freezing in the garage. Pretty much. And they mentioned proper grounding is important. Avoid hum. Always good practice. And interestingly, they recommend letting it warm up for about 15 minutes after turning it on. Ah, for the analog circuits to stabilize. Exactly. Helps ensure the tuning and performance are consistent. Analog stuff drifts a bit until it reaches operating temperature. Good tip, especially for tuning. Okay, what about software, firmware? We mentioned MIDI over USB. Right. So, as we said, it's class compliant, so generally, no drivers needed for MIDI. That's good. Makes life easier. But the guy does mention firmware updates. How do you get those? Through Behringer's Nthstrig app. They advise checking their website, behringer.com regularly for updates. So updates might add features or fix bugs? Potentially, yeah. It's yeah. usually a good idea to keep firmware up to date. So check the website now and then run the Synth Tribe app if needed. Got it. Mm -hmm. Now for the serious modular heads, installing this into a Eurorack case, the guide seemed quite cautious about this. Extremely cautious. It says very clearly this should only be done by experienced technicians. Because you could hurt yourself or damage the synth. Both. Risk of shock, Risk of frying something if you connect the power incorrectly. And the case itself needs the right power supply. We mentioned the 2 amp requirement. Yes, you need a Eurorack case, which isn't included, and its power supply must be able to provide that plus 12V at 2A plus the other standard Eurorack voltages. And they provide that adapter cable. The 10-pin to 16-pin ribbon cable adapter, yes. But connecting it requires care. So what's involved? Briefly. Okay, briefly. Power everything OKF first. Completely disconnect from mains. Crucial step. Then you carefully remove screws, take the synth assembly out of its desktop case, disconnect a specific internal ribbon cable. Sounds fiddly. It can be. Then you connect the adapter cable to the 2XM board, making sure the orientation is correct. Yeah. Usually marked with a red stripe on the cable. Polarity matters a lot. Hugely. Then connect the other end of that cable to a powered connector on your Eurorack bus board. Again, correct orientation. Then screw the module into the case. And double check everything before powering on the Eurorack case. Absolutely. The guide really stresses careful handling, especially of the ribbon cables and verifying connections. This is not a beginner task. Definitely sounds like something to approach with caution or leave to someone who knows their way around modular electronics. Agreed. Heed the warning. Okay. Shifting gears now away from the hardware and into the uh, legal paperwork. <laughs> The EULA and the image user agreement. Right. The less exciting but still important stuff. So the EULA end user license agreement, what's the main takeaway there? The big thing is you don't buy the software like the SynthDrive app or the Synth firmware. You license it. Meaning you get permission to use it, but you don't own it. Exactly. It's a contract between you and uh, Empower Tribe HQ FZE, who represent Music Tribe, Behringer's parent company. And the license has conditions. Oh, yes. It's described as limited, non-exclusive, perpetual, yeah. but also revocable and non-transferable. Non-transferable is key if you sell the synth secondhand, right? Yeah. The new owner doesn't automatically get the license. Correct. Technically, the license stays with the original user. Okay. What can't you do with the software? The usual restrictions. Yeah. No selling it, renting it, modifying it, trying to reverse engineer the code, removing copyright notices, standard stuff. They own the software IP. Yes. All intellectual property in the software belongs to Music Tribe or their partners. Mm. However, yes. you, the user, retain all the rights to the music and sounds you create using the software and the synth. Ah, that's a critical distinction. Your creative output is yours. Absolutely. They own the tool, you own what you make with it. Good. What else in the ELA? Anything about suggestions or updates? Yeah, if you give them feedback or ideas, those ideas become their property to use however they like without owing you anything. Hmm, okay. And they explicitly reserve the right to change, suspend, or even discontinue the software updates at any time. So even though the license is called perpetual, support and availability aren't guaranteed forever. Pretty much. 
It's perpetual unless they decide otherwise or unless you break the terms. Right, and termination. They can terminate your license anytime for any reason. It also terminates automatically if you violate the agreement. If it's terminated, you have to stop using the software and delete it. Standard procedure. What about third-party stuff? It acknowledges that the software might contain third-party components, which might have their own separate licenses you also need to follow. Mm. Music Drive isn't responsible for that third-party software. Okay. And warranties. Liability. If the software messes up. Big section on that. Basically, the software is provided as is. No warranties. Use at your own risk. To the maximum extent the law allows, yes. They disclaim all warranties. And their liability for any damages caused by the software is limited to what you actually paid for the software itself. Which, for firmware or a free app, is likely zero. Effectively, yes. There's also an indemnification clause. Meaning? You agree to cover Music Tribe's costs if they face legal issues arising from your misuse of the software or your violation of the agreement or laws. Okay. So, be sensible using it. Can they change the EULA itself? Yes. They reserve the right to change it. They say they'll give 30 days notice for major changes. If you keep using the software after that, you're agreeing to the new terms. And if you don't agree... Your permission to use it is revoked. Got it. Any other legal points? Governing law? Governing law is based on your place of residence. Mm -hmm. It clarifies no employment relationship is created. They can seek injunctions if you breach it. And any claims have to be filed within one year. It states the EULA is the entire agreement about the software. A lot to digest, but good to know the basic framework you're operating under. Definitely. It defines the relationship regarding the software. And quickly, the image user agreement. What was that about? That's about using pictures of the 2XM or other Behringer gear from their website. Right. You can only use them for editorial purposes like reviews or news articles, or if you're an official dealer selling the product. Can't use them to promote competing products. No, definitely not. And you can't alter the images in any way. No Photoshopping. No. And you have to include an attribution, courtesy of Empower Tribe HQ FZE. They own the images. Simple enough. Use them as is for legit purposes only. That's the gist. Okay, finally, any other miscellaneous bits from the guides or documents that are worth mentioning? Just a couple of practical things for the Quick Start Guide. Good they welcome. encourage you to register the product online at musictribe.com soon after buying it. For warranty and support. Yeah, they say it helps speed things up if you need repairs or have warranty claims. Makes sense. And it points you to the support section of their website if you do have malfunctions or need warranty info. So they have a support channel. And the last absolutely vital reminder check the mains voltage setting is correct for your country before plugging it in don't fry your new synth on day one please don't always check the voltage excellent but. advice okay so yeah bringing this all together after diving into the product page the manual the eula it really paints a full picture doesn't it you've yeah. got this uh powerful sounding dual voice analog synth packed with control euro rack ready loads of creative potential for sure. But then you also have the practicalities of setting it up, the safety warnings, and this quite detailed legal framework around the software and even the images. Yeah, examining all these sources gives you a much more complete sense of what the Behringer 2XM involves from making sounds to just, well, using it legally and safely. Mm, it really does. So that leads to a final thought for everyone listening. Yeah. When you consider this kind of instrument, deep analog control, lots of sonic possibilities, but also the software licenses, terms of use, firmware updates. How does that whole picture, that balance between creative freedom and the sort of uh, digital rules influence how you might approach making music with it? That's a great question. Does knowing about the ELA or the class compliance or the need for updates change anything? Or does the sheer sound potential just take over? And maybe think about all these features we discussed from the dual voices to the patch bake. Yeah. What new sonic areas does this knowledge make you want to explore? 